Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Neil Taylor and on behalf of the Rotocraft Specialist Group, I'm delighted to introduce the 2021 Royal Aeronautical Society Sierva Lecture. The Sierva Lecture is dedicated to the memory and achievements of Juan de la Sierva, one of the early pioneers of the rotary wing domain. The work we're going to hear about today is a fittingly groundbreaking technical achievement of the modern day. And it's a privilege to welcome Ben Pippenberg to brief us on the development of the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. We're planning to hold a brief question and answer session immediately after the lecture. So please do contribute to the question bar, which should be at the bottom right of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Ben Pippenberg. Ben is an aeromechanical engineer and engineering lead for the Mars helicopter program at Air Environment Incorporated. He received his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the Pennsylvania State University, and his technical background includes aircraft design, low Reynolds number aerodynamics, mechanical design, and composite design and fabrication. Ben is speaking to us today from his home in California. So Ben, good morning and over to you. Good morning. Um, let me see here. I'm trying to make sure my screen's sharing. All right, there we have it. Yes, yeah, good morning. Thank you, Neil. And uh, thank you to the Rotocraft Specialist Group, um, Simon and Stacy and Mark and everyone else who is involved. Uh, I'm really honored to be here talking to you today, and I'm excited to be uh, sharing some of the uh, work that the Mars helicopter team, the Ingenuity team, has been uh, accomplishing over the last seven or eight years or so. Um, sharing some of the trials and tribulations that we've gone through and um, maybe some of some of the successes as well. So uh, I'm happy to see that there are so many people that are interested in this, especially on a weeknight. Um, so who am I? My name is Ben Pippenberg, as Neil said. Um, I am an aeromechanical engineer at AeroVironment in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. Um, my academic background and uh, my interests for a long time have been in uh, very low Reynolds number aerodynamics and low Reynolds number aircraft design, like some of these vehicles that you can see here on the screen, um, including this small robotic hummingbird that's pictured in the center. Uh, this was designed and built in Air Environment's Nano Air Vehicle Lab. I worked on that as an intern in grad school um, 12 or 13 years ago. And this was my introduction to the Mars Helicopter Program, actually. A number of, uh, a number of us who worked on that project went on to work with JPL and the conceptual design uh, for Ingenuity uh, about eight years ago. And so for the last seven years, I've been acting as the engineering lead for Air Environment's Mars helicopter team. Um, and so through that capacity, I've worked on uh, a number of the prototypes as well as um, quite a bit of the final hardware. Obviously, we're a small piece of a very large team. Uh, the Ingenuity program is led by JPL Caltech uh, in Pasadena, out here in California, in collaboration with uh, NASA centers at Ames and Langley, uh, as well as us here at Air Environment and a number of other um, smaller subcontractors, Solero and Qualcomm and uh, a handful of uh, others as well. So JPL and NASA handled all of the avionics, guidance, navigation, control, simulation, uh, systems engineering, integration onto the primary spacecraft. And they're now handling all of the operations at Mars uh, as the helicopter has been flying. Here at Air Environment, we were responsible for uh, basically what you can see in that top image. So the rotor system design, uh, the landing gear, the rotor blades, the actuators like the motors, swash blades, servos, um, and uh, quite a bit of the primary structure. And so I'll be talking about the entire program here today, but I'll be a little bit biased towards hardware just because that's what I've had uh, my hands on more than just about anything else. But first, why would we want a helicopter on Mars? Um, right now, there's really several methods that we have to explore planets. Um, 
the most obvious, of course, being satellites and orbiters. So this is similar to the Google Earth view of um, planetary bodies. And so the image on the left is a pretty good example of what we can see from something like the high-rise imager uh, that's currently orbiting Mars. These kinds of vehicles give a really great wide area of view. We can use it to map uh, really, really wide spaces very quickly uh, and in great detail. But the surface resolution is not extremely good. The pixel size is about one meter on the ground. And so we can't really resolve some of the geological features that we want to be able to see, small rocks and things like that. On the other end of the spectrum, we have um, things like landers and rovers. So Curiosity and Perseverance rovers, which are currently operating on Mars, uh, are good examples of this. And these kinds of vehicles can give really great uh, surface imagery. We get right up to rocks. We can interact with the surface, do um, a lot of sampling. We can you know, directly collect material from the ground. But what we can't do is move very quickly, cover a lot of area, and cover even some of the most interesting terrain, some of the most uh, valuable science sites uh, are, are not really accessible. And so, for example, in the image on the left, uh, you can imagine trying to climb that cliff wall with a rover would not be simple. Um, and so that really limits some of, the, um, some of the value that we can get from these vehicles. And so this is where a helicopter comes into play. A helicopter can obviously uh, overfly some of these really sensitive or difficult to reach scientific zones and collect imagery at fairly high resolution from just a few meters above the surface, unlike an orbiter. And so um, this, this is really what kicked off the Mars helicopter program about eight years ago. And some of these early concepts really look pretty similar to where we ended up today with a couple of major differences. Um, a lot of this uh, preliminary work and conceptual design work was pretty much based on the experience that the team had with terrestrial helicopters here on Earth. And that was quite a bit of experience, but the big question is always, what are the unknown unknowns? Right? What do we not know about flying on Mars? And so the best way to kick that off, of course, is to start building and breaking things. If you want a buzzword, this would be like a fast failure iteration approach. Um, but it's pretty much just testing a whole bunch of stuff and seeing what sticks. And so some of the early testing was on fixed thrust stands, um, just to demonstrate that lift is possible in a Mars-like atmosphere. That was actually a, a big question early on. Of course, the physics says, hey, this should work. Um, it, it's fairly difficult to convince people of that until you show it. Um, and this uh, eventually led to tethered test flights in a vacuum chamber that, are, that has the atmosphere um, basically uh, mimicking that on Mars. And so that's this image over here on the right. You can see there's a little bit of marketing going on with the logos on it. But um, what we found out through some of these tests was that this is a little bit more difficult than we were initially expecting. And I'll show you a video here of what some of these tests look like. So here we have that little tethered helicopter takes off and completely out of control. And this was actually one of the better tests um, that we had. Immediately following this, we completely destroyed that aircraft. Um, and so, of course, that's very informative. Uh, and what we learned is that in this very low density atmosphere, which is about 1% of what we have here at sea level on Earth, we have, of course, uh, very low pressure, very low density. And so we have to spin the rotor blades much faster. These were spinning around 7,000 RPM for this little helicopter. Um, but the impact of that is that we have very low aerodynamic damping and very low Mach number. And so this is really acting much more like 
very high speed uh, flywheel that we have very little control over and very low damping. And so the way that we attempted to get around that and it was ultimately successful was to design an extremely rigid rotor system around two per rev first flap frequency. Um, and that allowed us to pretty much directly control the vehicle through hub moments uh, and just completely bypass all of the uh, uh, lower order rotor dynamics. And so by 2016, we had started to figure out how to fly in this kind of an environment. Uh, the first full-size helicopter that we successfully were able to control uh, was flown in May 2016. And this was a tethered vehicle. The power was run up through a power cable on the bottom of the helicopter. And um, that's really because here on Earth, the gravity is about three times higher than what we have on Mars. Um, Ingenuity actually would not be able to fly here on Earth, despite the density being higher, just because the gravity is so much higher as well. And so this is um, this vehicle was the same, uh, approximately the same weight as what we were expecting on Mars, but um, a much lower mass. And so here's what that looks like. And the helicopter is taking off, it's hovering in the chamber. All of the control for this video is happening actually on a desktop computer on the ground. It's being controlled through a motion capture system. But this was the first time that we were able to really show that, hey, this is possible. You know, we, we think that we can really do this. And so this started to lead into actually designing a helicopter that can not only fly in a Mars environment, but actually fly on Mars. And that's a much more difficult problem. First of all, Mars is very far from Earth. Um, when we landed, we were about 200 million miles away. And that means that the helicopter needs to be completely self-sufficient, right? We can't, I can't walk up and fix something when it breaks, right? Um, basically, the last time that we were able to see and touch and work on the helicopter, do maintenance on the helicopter was right before it was loaded onto the rocket and it left Earth, right? And so from that point on through the rest of the helicopter's life, it needs to be completely uh, self-sufficient. And that includes charging the batteries, um, any kind of uh, you know, deployments or overnight survival, for example, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and the atmosphere on Mars is also extremely thin, as I mentioned, it's about 1% of what we have here at uh, sea level on Earth. And it's primarily a CO2 atmosphere. And so the rotor system is pretty specialized, it's very large, lightweight uh, airframe. Spin the rotors relatively quickly. It's about 2,800 RPM, and that whole system needs to survive these very cold Martian nights. Gets down to about negative 100 degrees Celsius overnight, and it's about freezing, right around freezing, uh, in the middle of the afternoon. And so what that means is that the helicopter actually has to keep itself um, warm overnight. We don't want the batteries and the avionics to freeze, and so about 75%, 70 to 75% of the battery that we use during a day is just used to keep the helicopter warm overnight, to run heaters on the batteries um, and to run heaters on the avionics. And of course, to go along with that very low density, we have very challenging flight dynamics. As I said, there's very little damping uh, in the atmosphere and we have very high angular momentum in the rotor system. Uh, relative to the aerodynamic forces, so the lock number is very low. <laughs> we also have to survive getting off of Earth on a rocket, and this is really not something that's self-evident. Uh, we, we didn't initially appreciate just how, how violent this event is. Um, a rocket really is a controlled explosion that you're riding into space. And the highest loads that the helicopter ever sees are right when these main engines ignite, that first shock wave basically reflects back up off of the launch pad into the shroud, travels up through the primary structure of the rocket right into our poor, fragile little helicopter. And so it really is a very, very violent event. Um, the loads that we see are about an order of magnitude higher 
than the worst case loads that we see while we're actually flying to Mars, even with the very rigid rotor. And so all of the primary structure is really designed to handle uh, this event rather than flying. And as I mentioned, um, we caught a ride to Mars with another primary mission. This is the Mars 2020 mission or the Perseverance uh, Mars rover. You can see on the pictures on the left, shaded in purple, where Ingenuity uh, sits on the belly pan of the rover. And on the right, you can see that picture before the debris shield was added to cover up the helicopter. And so there are two challenges here. First of all, we have to fit into this very confined space. You know, it's really barely recognizable on a helicopter because the helicopter is all folded up to fit into that area. The other challenge is that the Perseverance rover's primary mission, you know, the reason that we're sending this multi-billion dollar spacecraft to Mars is to collect samples and search for signatures of life uh, that may have existed millions or billions of years ago uh, on the surface. And so you can imagine that uh, we really, really don't want to find signatures of my life on Mars or anybody else that has worked on any of this hardware. And so as a result, we need to have very, very clean fabrication practices. Um, the materials that we use are uh, very specialized to limit outgassing. The processes that we use are specialized to limit contamination. And so really from the very beginning of the program, um, that was a major constraint on some of the fabrication practices that we could use. And to go along with that folded geometry, the helicopter obviously needs to be able to get off of the rover and down onto the ground. And on the bottom right, you can see what that process looks like as the helicopter is unfolding. And so the landing gear all uh, unfolds. There's locking mechanisms on all rotor blades that uh, are deployed. And then the helicopter is finally dropped to the surface and it's able to operate. And so the final design um, basically looks like this. And some of you may have seen this um, over the last six months or so during operations. The helicopter has about a 1.2 meter uh, diameter rotor weighs uh, the mass is around 1.8 kilograms, which is um, four pounds here on Earth. It's about a third of that on Mars. It was actually designed to fly for just 90 seconds. Um, the 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 main constraint there is actually thermal limits. So everything um, getting warm during the course of a flight. Uh, to go along with that very low density, one of the interesting challenges um, on Mars is that we're effectively heating everything adiabatically. Uh, there really isn't effective convective cooling uh, due to that very low dense density atmosphere. And so as a result, all of our waste heat that's being dumped into the avionics, into the batteries, into the motors, uh, is essentially being stored in those components. And so to prevent overheating, um, the flight times are limited to very, very, uh, very, very short durations. And so here's a little bit better view of how that helicopter anatomy is laid out. So at the very top of the helicopter, we have an antenna, which is used to communicate with the Perseverance rover. And from there, the Perseverance rover is communicating through orbiting satellites at Mars back to the deep space network here on Earth. So it's a long bent chain of communications to get information back off of the helicopter. Um, that antenna is attached to uh, the solar array. And the solar array is recharging the primary flight batteries, the lithium ion batteries uh, that are mounted down here in the bottom of the helicopter. The rotor system is uh, hopefully fairly familiar to this group. So we've got a counter-rotating coaxial rotor system with two swash plates, one on each rotor, and both rotors have collective as well as cyclic control. And those rotors are driven by um, brushless motors that are attached directly to the hubs. The landing gear system, it's here at the bottom, uh, that's folding to fit on the bottom of the Perseverance rover and that 
employees, as I showed in the last slide. And then finally, we have what we call the helicopter warm electronics box. And this is basically a very thin film material over a composite frame. It's about a half mil thick uh, Kapton material that has a special metallized coating on both the inside and the outside. And the purpose of this is to keep the electronics core module and all of the batteries warm. So it's essentially acting as a reflective surface to prevent radiation, uh, prevent heat from radiating out of that electronics core module. And that's what you can see down here in the bottom right. And so the rotor blade that I mentioned, um, there are several things that make this slightly different or slightly specialized from what we would typically design for a rotor here on Earth. First of all, the Reynolds number that we're operating at is very low. It's around 10,000. And this is kind of similar to the uh, flow characteristics of something like a butterfly here on Earth. However, the tip Mach number is also very high. It's around 0.78 on Mars at our highest RPM. And so that's more similar to something like commercial transport aircraft. And so it's a very unusual aerodynamic regime that the helicopter blades are operating in. Um, in addition to that, these rotor blades needed to be extremely rigid, extremely high first flap frequency, high regressive flap frequency for the controls uh, solution to work out. And so one of the primary drivers, one of the main reasons the rotors look the way that they actually do is to hit that very high regressive first flap frequency while also keeping the weight very, very low. And you can see on the right-hand side here what that fabrication method looks like. So it's a machined foam core with high modulus carbon fiber skins and spar caps. And this is all molded in um, aluminum tooling. So it's a one-piece rotor blade uh, as it comes out of the mold. And these rotor blades are driven by uh, brushless electric motors. Anybody that's worked on either little drones or on model airplanes or model helicopters uh, will probably recognize this kind of an architecture. And these are pretty similar to a lot of the motors that are in this same class with a couple of exceptions. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, one of the uh, unfortunate side effects of that low density atmosphere is that we don't get effective convective cooling. And so there's this machined component here at the center of the, uh, of the motor that you can see in the bottom left. And that's uh, really a heat sink. It's an aluminum beryllium metal matrix with a very high specific heat capacity, high thermal conductivity, um, and very low coefficient of thermal expansion. It's kind of a specialized material that happens to work really well for what we needed to do here, which is to store a lot of that uh, waste energy from the motor efficiency. These things also need to get very cold, obviously, um, as well as very hot. They need, they need to operate up to about uh, 130 degrees Celsius during operation and get as low as about negative 100 degrees Celsius um, overnight. And they're driven by this uh, motor driver board that's co-located with the motors. And that's to keep uh, all of that waste heat just up there with the motors rather than in the ECMs as well as uh, to keep electronic noise basically out of the avionics. The rotors are also controlled by uh, these little electric motors. These are basically geared brushed motors, very similar to what we would see in servos, either for industrial applications or for hobby helicopters or hobby uh, drones. And these are driving a swash plate that uh, provides collective and cyclic control to the rotor system itself. And so, um, as with everything else on the helicopter, these are environmentally sealed to prevent dust incursion. We really don't want to get any of this Mars dust into those uh, fiddly little gearboxes. And so far, this appears to be working quite well. Uh, these servos have operated well through the 13 flights so far on Mars. And um, continuing on with all these fiddly little mechanisms all over the helicopter, uh, <laughs> here we have the landing gear. 
So this is the deployment hinge and the landing gear flexures um, that allow the landing gear to actually deploy as the helicopter is coming off of the rover. And there are a number of redundant springs in the system, as well as little latches that flip into place to lock the, uh, lock the gear once it's deployed. And this is kind of a difficult problem, really, designing landing gear in general to operate on Mars, because we can't effectively test it in that low gravity here on Earth. Um, it, it's it's, it's a, a fairly difficult problem because, uh, of course, Mars has much lower gravity. I, I think I mentioned earlier, it's about one third of what we have here. And so as we're coming down from a landing in our kind of most violent worst case scenarios that we could uh, possibly imagine if things are really going wrong, um, the helicopter has quite a bit of bounce to it. Uh, it. It basically hits the ground and it really takes off again. Um, and so adding sufficient damping was a pretty high priority for us during the design uh, of the system. You can see over here on the left, we call out this aluminum damper. Um, basically, the way that this system works is there's a titanium flexor, which provides the spring rate, basically like the springs on your car. Uh, and that's the suspension as the landing gear uh, starts to load up. And then above that, there's this aluminum damper. This is just a dead soft uh, sheet of 1100 series aluminum that we're intentionally yielding as that titanium flexure starts to bend. And so all of that strain energy that's going into that piece of aluminum is basically going into heating and going into damping. And this system actually worked quite well. It's really consistent across a wide range of temperatures and environments and atmospheres. Um, and it tends to degrade very uh, deterministically. And so we could test this in an Earth atmosphere and have very high confidence that we have what we have on Mars uh, is going to really match what we've been able to test. <clears throat> And of course, all of these components on the helicopter need to be, uh, you know, infinitely lightweight and infinitely strong and stiff. Uh, and so most of the primary structures are uh, fabricated from composites of various types. Um, and this was really one of the enabling technologies that allowed ingenuity uh, to really work is that we can hit these very high specific strength numbers. Um, and very, very low mass systems, including all of the rotor blades and all of the landing gear, uh, really the primary structure for the helicopter as well. And the materials that we use to do that meet all of those very difficult contamination control and uh, planetary protection guidelines that uh, were so critical to being able to uh, mount this whole thing onto the rover. <clears throat> and all of these composites uh, were built here at our environment in our clean rooms. Um, this is to prevent any contaminants from Earth, any contaminants from us as we're fabricating these parts from getting to Mars and showing up in any of the scientific instruments and scientific tests that the primary mission is trying to accomplish. And so there was really almost pathological um, cleaning of all of this hardware, uh, both dry heat molecular reduction, which is a fancy way of saying we just heat it up really hot, um, as well as uh, chemical cleaning. So isopropanol and uh, in many cases, much more harsh chemicals as well. After fabrication, um, this whole system goes through quite a bit of environmental testing. And this is probably going to be pretty familiar to many folks in the rotorcraft community. Um, the, the real tests that we go through are primarily environmental. So uh, thermal stress, uh, shock testing, vibration, um, you know, all of the same things that we would do with helicopter components here on Earth, except that in our case, what we're trying to prove out is that we can survive things like rocket launches, um, you know, that high vibration environment on the rocket and the environments on Mars. So day in the life testing through one Mars diurnal cycle uh, to show that the batteries are able to heat themselves, that the avionics aren't going to die. 
And the most exciting part of this is probably the flight testing. So we had a number of test venues that we went through. Um, the, the really critical one here, and this is a pretty cool facility, is the 25-foot space simulator uh, at JPL. This is uh, basically a 25-foot diameter by 80-foot tall um, vacuum chamber, really, which can simulate the vacuum of space uh, and many of the temperature profiles as well. Liquid nitrogen can be pumped through radiators in the walls to drop the temperature to several hundred degrees below zero. Um, and in our case, we were backfilling this chamber with CO2 to mimic a Mars atmosphere. And so all of the flight testing on the helicopter was done at this facility. There were about 200, over 200 tests on uh, the various iterations of this helicopter uh, and across many, many different test venues. Uh, there, there was gimbal testing to tune individual axes of the helicopter. Uh, there was a swinging arm, it's shown in the bottom left, uh, which is used to characterize forward flight. And there was a wind wall, uh, which is basically hundreds of computer fans all strung together, which can characterize uh, wind response, essentially, of the vehicle. Um, and here's what some of that testing looks like. This is one of the first flights with the helicopter totally independent. And so all of the navigation and uh, guidance is happening on board. On the top left, you can see the view that the helicopter is seeing, all those little crosses on the floor are uh, simulating the surface features that we would see on Mars, so things like rocks. Um, and that's really critical because all of the navigation that's happening uh, on Ingenuity is being done with visual processing. We don't have GPS on Mars. We don't have GPS satellites on Mars. And so position estimates have to happen uh, visually. And so this was one of the real first tests on that final flight hardware. Um, and it's really very similar to what we've uh, been seeing on Mars. It's, it's incredibly close, actually. So physics still works uh, on the red planet as well. <clears throat> All right, so this is starting to get into some of the exciting stuff with uh, pre-launch activities. Um, here you can see a similar view to what I was showing a few minutes ago with Ingenuity mounted onto the bottom of the Perseverance rover as it's being integrated into the rest of the primary spacecraft. And in the picture on the right, you can see uh, circled in that little blue uh, shape there, Ingenuity's debris shield just before closing out the heat shield. The heat shield is that kind of singed looking yellow part on the bottom right. And that's what protects the whole spacecraft during entry into the Mars atmosphere. Um, basically, all of, that, uh, all of that speed that we're coming to Mars with is burned off uh, prior to parachute deployment. And Ingenuity is right up next to that heat shield, right? There's 2,500 degrees Celsius plasma on the outside, and then um, just a couple of centimeters away from that is uh, the helicopter, really, in this very sensitive primary structure. And the heat shield is all that's protecting us from that environment. And also, um, as the heat shield is deployed, then Ingenuity is the first thing leading the charge through the Mars atmosphere. And if anything had gone wrong, uh, we would have been the first thing to come into contact with the planet, um, which obviously didn't happen. So <laughs> that's uh, a very good thing. And so by July 30th of last year, um, the whole spacecraft was integrated and ready for launch. This happened out of Cape Canaveral uh, on an Atlas V rocket. Spent um, the next few months during a uh, uh, cruise, just sitting there waiting to arrive. And then on February 18th of this year, we arrived uh, after what's kind of colloquially known as the seven minutes of terror uh, as, as the rover and the helicopter are lowered to the surface by essentially as hovering quad rotor uh, kind of a system uh, with rockets on it. And that brings us up to surface operations. 
And so after uh, quite a bit of commissioning, about a month and a half of commissioning of all of the systems on the spacecraft, uh, Ingenuity began this process to be deployed onto the surface. And you can see here some of the images uh, that were taken of that process. So this is actually on Mars uh, during deployment. And the helicopter is being rotated down into position by what we call the Mars Helicopter Deployment System, aptly named, which was developed by uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, JPL. And so you can see the landing gear deploying here, and it's just about ready to be dropped onto the surface. And really, this, this looks very quick. It looks very simple. Uh, this whole process actually took about um, seven days to complete. Uh, every step along the way was very, very carefully checked. Everything was very carefully analyzed to make sure that nothing was going to be damaged by proceeding. And so finally, by uh, early April of this year, the helicopter was a standalone spacecraft sitting on the surface of Mars, uh, ready for operations. One thing that's interesting, the eagle-eyed amongst you may see on this image that the solar array looks pretty dirty. Um, and it is. What actually happened, and this wasn't expected, uh, what actually happened was as Ingenuity was uh, being lowered onto the surface, the debris shield that's used to protect it from any rocks being kicked up uh, by the rocket blast of that rocket crane, uh, it's not particularly well sealed around all of the edges. And so just like a door that you've left ajar in a snowstorm or something like that, um, all of the dust can get in. And it can't really damage things. Um, it just gets dusty, which Ingenuity was designed for. But in this case, all of that dust accumulated on that deployment system. And as Ingenuity was deployed, it was all deposited right on top of the solar panel. Um, it turned out to not be an issue. As usual with spacecraft, there was an enormous amount of margin built in uh, to the solar array sizing and the uh, energy uh, margins that are required to survive overnight. Um, but this was one of the first real unexpected uh, surprises that we had. And so within a couple of weeks of being dropped onto the surface, Ingenuity was completely ready uh, to do what it had come to do and fly on the surface of Mars. And so here's what that video looks like. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, helicopter just takes off. It hovers three meters above the ground for 30 seconds. It rotates a little bit, and then it's just going to land. Um, very, very simple. Uh, but really, this was the culmination of the entire program. Um, all that we were trying to show here with this technology demonstration is that, hey, helicopters can fly on Mars, and they can be used as a scientific instrument in the future. And so this very effectively did that. You know, um, And it's still incredible to look at this and think that you know, this is happening 200 million miles away on the surface of a completely alien planet. And so really just is absolutely mind blowing. And so since this time, uh, this was in April, uh, April 19th to be exact, Ingenuity has flown an additional uh, 12 times, 13 flights in total at this point. The first five were really the baseline flights, and that's all that we were expecting to get through. You know, if everything went perfectly, we we're expecting five flights. Um, and at that point, we were expecting the mission to be over. We were expecting Ingenuity to be left behind, and Perseverance would go uh, go on to do, you know, really what it was meant to do, which is collect primary science. Um, it turned out, of course, that Ingenuity was still operating after those five flights. It was still able to provide valuable data. And the operations team at JPL uh, really was able to show that they weren't so much of a pain to the rest of the operations team that they were allowed to keep on operating. So at this point, Ingenuity has uh, flown a total of about 25 minutes, much, much longer than any of us were really expecting. And much longer than it was designed to fly. It's traveled about 2.9 kilometers total. Um, and we've been operating on the surface, so uh, continually heating and uh, cooling 
for 171 days of operation. And still going, fingers crossed, but still going strong today. And over here on the right, you can see what that flight path has looked like uh, up through flight 10 here. On the top, flights one through four all happened within a very small flying field. Uh, and since then, we've been uh, essentially flying out ahead of the Perseverance rover, um, not just to scout. Uh, they have now been using our imagery to scout, but also just to stay within communications range. Uh, the helicopter relies entirely on radio communications with Perseverance, and so we need to stay pretty close to the rover uh, to be able to communicate with mission controllers here on Earth. And so really the reason that Ingenuity uh, is generating excitement within the science community at this point is that it's able to pretty quickly take high resolution images of some of these very high value science targets at Mars um, from the air. And this image on the left in particular was one that really got a lot of folks excited. Uh, that outcropping on the right uh, in particular is, is really something that the science community uh, was very interested to see. And you can kind of see over in the right picture here, um, Perseverance has crossed paths with where Ingenuity flew on a previous flight. And that flight was used as scouting for that path planning on uh, Perseverance. And so, at this point, Ingenuity is being used for science missions. It's proving itself to be a really useful uh, asset to the rest of the team. And um, so, you know, we're hoping to continue that and hoping to uh, build on that in the future with uh, much more advanced helicopters. And the performance so far on Mars has been really shockingly close to what we were expecting. Um, as I said before, physics appears to still hold true on Mars. Uh, that's really good news. Um, the measured performance at Jezero Crater, where we've been flying, is very similar to what we were seeing uh, here in the vacuum chambers on Earth. Um, the flight time is still limited by the heat rise in the motor, but uh, we've been able to fly for roughly twice as long as uh, what the initial expectations were. And part of that is that, um, you know, now that we're actually operating on Mars, we can see that we can pull back some of the margin that we added to the design. Uh, NASA has a tendency, I think, to um, under-promise and over-deliver. You know, that, there's a little bit of that here. Um, but also the conditions that we've been flying in are very, very good. Um, the temperatures have been a little bit warmer than what we've designed against. Uh, the density is pretty much spot on. The uh, overnight survival story has been uh, quite good. The temperatures that we've been seeing at night are uh, within what the helicopter is able to handle. And the thermal insulation is working really well. Those optical coatings on the warm electronics box uh, have been working well, they've been staying clean. And so the power margins are very, very good. And they're very close to what JPL has been predicting. And so all of this data is being collected and rolled into hopefully future uh, helicopters that are currently being developed. Um, NASA Ames is leading uh, a much larger science helicopter program, looking at the conceptual design of a vehicle that can fly for about seven minutes at a time and carry about six kilograms of science payload. And this would be a standalone mission um, as a primary science mission. Essentially, it would be acting instead of a rover uh, at Mars. And, and so that's a very, very exciting prospect for a lot of people. Um, and you know, we think that there are very compelling science reasons to do that. Independently, Air Environment is also looking at uh, smaller or more advanced versions of ingenuity uh, that could tag along as uh, um, essentially a paired helicopter with landers and uh, future rovers, sort of like what Ingenuity is doing now, uh, but adding quite a bit of capability. So much longer flight times, uh, adding potentially mobility systems, adding manipulators so that we can collect samples um, and 
very precisely position the helicopter over things like rocks or geological features that we want to get a closer look at. And so uh, I think the future is bright for this. I think that there is a lot of interest right now in uh, future helicopter work on Mars. And um, I, I really am excited to see what the future holds for this kind of a concept. And so that's what I've got. Um, thank you all very, very much for uh, listening in. And I, I believe that now we're going to go to a question session. Ben, fascinating brief. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, really, really good detail on the design. Really good also to get an update of what you, you think the future looks like and, and effectively what's been going on since. Um, obviously, you were in the eye of the, the world media um, for quite some time. So, um, so, yeah, very interesting. We'll launch into the questions. We've got quite a few. Um, and so apologies in advance if um, if we, we don't get around to your particular one. Um, so. I'd like to kick off with, um, it's actually the one I sent you while I was on mute. Um, so how much iterative back and forth was there between the rover and the helicopter designs? Or was it the case that you had to fit in entirely within a, a frozen rotor, uh, rover design, sorry? Yeah, no, there was quite a bit of back and forth actually. And um, initially at the outset, um, we weren't expecting to be on the belly pan of the rover at all. We were expecting to be kind of tucked up into almost the armpit um, under one of the rocker bogey arms on the side of the uh, on the side of the rover. Um, and through the course of the design work, uh, what we found was that you know that really didn't work well for us. We had to fold the rotor blades, which we really didn't want to do, as we found out that uh, the rotor needed to be very rigid. Um, and it really didn't work for the rover team either. Uh, they really wanted to route a whole bunch of wiring right through where the helicopter sat. And so it turned out that the space on the bottom uh, really worked well for both of us. Um, and then, yeah, there was some iteration there on the sizing of that. But So was the, was the rover effectively kind of like mostly frozen they were other than those um th those tweaks yeah that, that was, yeah, that was well, as well ahead of time yeah primarily um we we were able to um to some degree drive the design of that belly pan uh, there were some modifications that were made to that um but for the most part yeah it was frozen we we were much much later in the schedule than they were understood very impressed as well with just the sheer amount of testing that you managed to achieve um, on Earth, simulating all those or, or um, representing all those different conditions. Can you give us a feeling, um, obviously extensive test program that you covered, were there any um, aspects of simulation that you kind of found yourself relying on? And can you talk us through that please? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So uh, JPL developed a really great integrated simulation environment um, that they call Helicat. And it's based on a nonlinear dynamics model that was uh, designed for the initial uh, entry, well, it's not the entry vehicle, the rock, what we call the rocket crane that lowered Curiosity, the previous rover, uh, onto the surface of Mars. And um, Hovart Grip at JPL and uh, a number of other engineers on the uh, GNC team and on the simulation team modified that to accommodate basically a helicopter, right? They added a blade element momentum model uh, that's run in real time. And so that was absolutely critical, you know, to modeling what we expected to see on Mars because we can never test exactly the Mars environment, right? We can't test the gravity, reduce gravity on Earth other than through kind of these gravity offload mechanisms, uh, which of course aren't very realistic, right? So yeah, absolutely. That was that was a huge piece of uh, proving that this would be uh, possible. Are there any um, are there any lessons learned for how you might design or operate on on Earth that have actually come out of this activity? Great question. So um, you know, here at Air Environment, one of the previous programs that the Air Environment engineers have worked on was. Uh, the Helios airplanes, and these are very high altitude solar powered aircraft. Um, a lot of the environments are actually kind of similar. Uh, that airplane was flown at, uh, I think, 98,000 feet above 
sea level, um, so very high. Uh, and that environment is pretty similar to what we see on Mars. The density is pretty close. Um, and now here today, our environment is again working on some of these very high altitude solar airplanes. And a lot of the lessons that we learned from design, building, and flying ingenuity are being rolled back into those programs, both in terms of the composite materials, um, some of the radiation environments, uh, the motor design, especially. Yes, absolutely. That's being rolled forward. And um, lot, lots of interest as well in the in the future designs. Now I appreciate there might be some sensitivities around that, given the kind of still uh, still proposals. Um, but can you just give us a little rundown of of what what are the key kind of like areas of change that you'd look at? And secondary question as well: one of the design features that you almost alluded to um, was that you might be able to either partially or entirely replace the rover. So. Do you, do you see that as being kind of like, does, does that look technically credible? And do you think that's a realistic aim? Yeah, so it, it does look technically credible. Um, you know, it's a pretty specialized kind of a mission set, right? The, the payload, the scientific payload that can be carried on a helicopter, of course, is always going to be less than what we can put on a fixed lander, right? A fixed lander is just going to sit there on the surface. Um, but it, it absolutely looks credible. Um, Ingenuity by itself is effectively a standalone spacecraft. Uh, the only interaction that it has with the rover is through communications. And we know that we can you know, communicate um, directly with satellites if we put the correct radios on, right? So it's a matter of carrying that, uh, that mass. Um, some of the upgrades or you know, advances that are being made uh, to allow these longer flight times and these much larger vehicles. Um, there are definitely advances just in terms of, you know, now we know what these environments look like, right? We can we can start to start to more directly optimize for uh, for you know a point design rather than having to design for a very, very wide range of densities or a very wide uh, range of landing conditions like what we currently are doing with ingenuity. Um, in addition to that, NASA Ames is looking at um, advances in aerodynamics, basically lower uh, lower Reynolds number airfoils that can go to higher tip Mach numbers, higher figure of merit. Um, Air environment is looking at uh, some of the power systems, so motor efficiency, the cooling. So one of the main drivers for flight times on Mars right now is cooling all of these components. So we're looking at um, very large radiative coolers or convective coolers, uh, as well as phase change materials. So pumping heat into basically blocks of ice, um, you know, rather than just storing it into metals. So quite a bit of work to be done there. Uh, quite a bit of work is going on as well. Excellent. Um, I have a question for you. So I guess this could be interpreted as, as being lighthearted or, or serious, but what did you do for the two weeks between deployment and first flights? Other than, you know, <laughs> Very good question. Um, so, so one of the main limiting factors uh, during those two weeks um, is just the communications delay, right? So we, we really only get a few windows per day where there's a satellite overhead that the Perseverance rover can uh, you know, have a window to talk to. And then that satellite needs to get to a position around Mars where we have direct line of sight to Earth. And so that kind of bent pipe uh, pipeline really limits the communications uh, time that we have. Um, in addition to that, there was a lot of commissioning uh, that was going on during those times. And there were a couple of issues that did spring up. One of them actually required a software update uh, just prior to flight. Um, it, it was a minor minor problem, but of course, as you can imagine, updating flight software from 200 million miles away is never simple. And so that ate a few days of the time as well. Excellent, excellent. Uh, just have a quick scan just to make sure we're not... Uh, yeah, I think we've 
I think we've probably covered the main the main topic areas actually in terms of um, in terms of future development testing. I mean we've had a had some yeah particularly strong themes on testing, um, but I think you've you've managed to actually cover large numbers of those off with uh, with some very efficient answers. So given that we've got a um, a, a six o'clock start, unless there's any uh, sorry six o'clock local. Um, stop um okay one final one on the testing um side then so is there anything you can tell us ben um about how material was tested at minus um, 100 degrees c yes absolutely so uh it, it really depends on which materials um we're talking about the composites um we really didn't have a particularly strong test program to pull out material allowables uh, at those temperatures. It's something that we absolutely would have loved to do. Um, but what we were doing was uh, a protoflight development program. And so basically what that means is that every piece of flight hardware is tested at a realistic environment uh, to some test factor uh, that's above you know, the worst case limit load that we're expecting to see. And so there was quite a bit of iterative de design uh, and then environmental testing on the actual components at the component level, in many cases to failure, uh, prior to going through that protoflight development program. And so for the materials in particular, um, one of the main areas that we were concerned about were thermal stresses at the interfaces between metallics and composites, right? Composites tend to have a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, metals are typically higher, right, depending on what the metals are. Um, and so there was quite a bit of testing on those bonded interfaces. Uh, you know, a lot of the primary stress in the adhesives is actually coming from the thermal stress rather than from uh, the loads that are being applied directly. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm not going to say that we did a great material testing program uh, that you're ever going to see um, you know, results from, unfortunately. But uh, there was, you know, I, I suppose you could say very uh, robust testing that was done on uh, individual components to make sure they would work. Excellent, thank you. Um, so given that we're rapidly approaching, let's say, the, the end point, unfortunately, um, I'd like to draw things to a close. So. Um, obviously, thank you, Ben. Um, excellent brief. And so it's a bit of a shame you can't obviously receive any applause or anything like that. But I can tell you from the, from the questions, they've, they've all been congratulating you on the quality of your brief. So um, so I'll, I'll certainly pass that on. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's, who's dialed in and indeed everyone who watches this, uh, the recording after the event. And also thank you to uh, my colleagues on the uh, Royal Aeronautical uh, Society Rotorcraft Specialist Group and also the, the organisers um, in the RS events team, particularly uh, particularly Stacey for all the hard work she's put into this. Um, please do come back to us. We're very interested in your feedback. If you do get an opportunity to fill in the, uh, the feedback form, then we'd be very keen for that. And um, yeah, hopefully see you at one of these events in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>